Right, hello everybody. I'm, I'm aiming here to give you a very quick but I hope useful summary of the psychodynamic approach that would be good for a 16 mark answer. And I hope that some of the tips that I give you here will be useful overall. First of all, Freud's model is a very exciting and interesting model that sometimes students get a bit messed, messed up with, mainly because they tend to overdo description of these AO1 theory points. So if you're going to do a very open-ended 16 marker, and that would mean there is no scenario, I suggest that you just use these three points. I suggest you begin with the iceberg theory, then you go on to discuss the id, ego, super ego, that's the structure of the mind, and then you go on to these defense mechanisms which, which link in here, okay, and they link in here. What you notice I've actually missed out are the psychosexual stages. And that's deliberate because it's not good to waste your time waffling on about the anal stage and the oral stage and the phallic stage because you miss out these things here which are crucial to Freud's theory and crucial for the link with the AO3 evaluation. So you don't need psychosexual stages. Well, you need to learn them for the exam because you might be asked about them. There might be like a multi-choice question or anything. You need to learn them. My advice would be leave them out of a 16 marker. So I would start here with the iceberg theory. I would explain about the mind as an iceberg with the subconscious part of the mind hidden being the largest part and the tip of the iceberg being our conscious mind and explain all that you've learned in there which would include how our fears and our phobias and our childhood trauma are sort of hidden here which we've no no like awareness of however when do we get awareness of our subconscious mind in our dreams okay that's for two marks I wouldn't go too far with it. And then I would link it into the structure, which is the, the id, the ego, and the superego. I've explained them the way I teach them as a child, an adult, a parent, but you mightn't have learned them like that, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but you must explain shortly that these are all to do with a conflict happening in our mind. And that is, of course, between the id and the superego. Because the id is like the baby in your mind that wants everything now. The superego is like a parent saying, no, naughty kid, you can't do it. And so in the end, you end up, you know, having to depend on your ego to save you from the battle. And the ego needs a defense mechanism to deal with all the horrors going on here. And so in the end, the ego develops these defense mechanisms to deal with that situation. Here's a good example. Let's say you need to do your homework. That's what you must do to get your grades and your A-level, or maybe not your A-level. Let's just say you're a bit sort of younger than that. You got to do your homework. Well, that's your super ego saying, I must do it. I should do it. It's like a parent in your head. It's not your parent, but it's you saying, I must do it. I should do it. And then you have this little sort of baby in you who wants everything now. I don't want to do my homework. I want to watch some videos. I want to go on the internet. I want to phone my friends. I want to do blah, blah, blah. So there's a conflict, okay, what you want to do and what you should do, okay, between the id and the superego. So what tends to happen is the, the middle part of your mind, okay, the adult can't deal with it and therefore develops defense mechanisms. So you may go into denial that your homework is important at all. You may develop all sorts of defense mechanisms, okay. You don't need to give a big example like that in a 16 marker, but that was just to go over it. And then you explain, okay, what are these defense mechanisms, how they are useful for our mental health, 
I would just use maybe two of them. I would choose denial and maybe repression because students understand them. And I would talk about denial as being where you deny the reality of your situation and it makes you feel okay. And of course, repression, where you don't even recognize you've even sort of got a problem. So you might be an alcoholic and you may have repressed all idea that you actually are an alcoholic, you know, or you may be in denial as well. They often go together. And then you could link it into subconscious mind. OK, because when you've got a defense mechanism, you have no idea that you do. It's all hidden in your subconscious mind. OK, so I'd leave it there. That's enough for six marks. Now, you need to evaluate this model. There are loads of really good evaluation points. I have tended here to go for the ones which are most useful, I think. First of all, universality of this um, psychodynamic approach. It is universally applicable. You can waffle on for quite a bit about this. You've got you need to get, um, you know, five marks here, maybe five marks here, but it doesn't have to be divided like that. It's very easy if you know what to say. So maybe take a few notes as I'm going through it. This is a universally applied approach. It doesn't depend where you're brought up, what your culture is, what your race is, what your religion is, anything at all. It's all to do with human beings everywhere. And that's a very dynamic thing about the model. It's a very positive thing about the model. Um, and what is also good about that is that it really explains why it's been so successful long term. No, it's not scientific, but still people learn about Freud. Still people become psychoanalysts. Still people go for Freudian therapy and lie on the couch and have themselves psychoanalyzed. It's, it is really a long term. I mean, you know, Freud was around in the 1890s. I mean, what other psychologists are still going strong, really? You know, obviously he's not alive, but he's alive and kicking in his theory. <laughs> And, uh, it, you know, this is a reason why it's a universally applicable approach. And the other point is psychoanalysis. Now, get this right. What is good about it is not that there is a therapy, because there's a therapy for CBT with the cognitive approach. There's loads of drugs for the biological approach. So why is it good? It's good because it gets rid of defense mechanisms and it gets rid of the idea that we've got a deterministic approach. I'll go back on that in a minute. So psychoanalysis means you go into a therapist, you pay loads of money, lie on the couch. You mightn't say anything for an hour, but the guy or the woman is, you know, sitting here, you know, not in front of you, behind you, and they are, they are, maybe taking some notes, of course, you know, Freud never did, and they are analysing your unconscious or subconscious motivations, and they're trying to bring up all the conflict in your mind, and they are, you know, ultimately aiming to resolve your defence mechanism. What's the point about it? If you just explain what they do, that becomes AO1. So why is it AO3? Here's the point. It's a real-world application this is not just a dead pan theory from the 1890s. This is alive and kicking in our world. I would also make this point a very good point. If I was marking and I saw this, I'd give it loads of marks. I would, um, you know, you need to bring it into everyday life. So where do or what areas of mental health is it good for, right? It could be good for depression, but generally not. It's for things like... When you've got anorexia, bulimia for eating disorders, it's been found to be superb. So even if you've not done eating disorders in your spec, you can still mention it. It really works for anorexics. Long-term psychoanalysis helps them to deal with the mother conflict. Very often it's a mother conflict or a family dynamic, and psychoanalysis helps with that. That's a real-life application really good mark winner. Now, what's the minus with this model? 
Well, obviously, it's unscientific data. Why? Because Freud used case studies. And he studied middle-class Viennese females, okay? Now, students just ramp this off, and it's a good thing to say, yes, they were middle-class Viennese and women, but you've got to bring in why it's a problem. It's a problem because you've got a few biases. You've got a gender bias. He mostly analyzed early on in his career females because they were available. What guys wanted to come in and lie on the couch with Freud, if you get what I'm saying. <laughs> they were, you know, middle class housewives, very well off normally, who didn't have anything much to do. They weren't educated because nobody got an education then if you were female. And basically, they were sort of bored and a bit neurotic, that was the word used for them. And um, they got a lot out of this wonderful um, attention, I think, they got from Dr. Freud. Or maybe they were sent there, you know, by their husbands, and you need to look into it. Either way, they were middle class, so there's a class bias, okay? They were not working class women. And, of course, they were from Vienna, a culture bias. So a very small group of people he was analysing to make his theory. And, of course, he analysed himself. So what you need to say is, apart from all the biases I've just mentioned, the culture bias, the gender bias, and the class bias, you want to mention that Freud was also researcher bias because he was analysing himself. It all seems very, very negative and unscientific. It is. But it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Maybe he was just a genius and that's it. But don't write that. Okay, so a lot of... Um, and you can also say, and here's another point. Now, uh, you know, I haven't seen this a lot, but I've always told my students to write this. It's a really good mark winner. Why is it not satisfactory? It isn't just the fact that he used middle-class Viennese women and case studies, it is that he didn't take notes. No, Freud didn't write anything down. His memory was so superb, he could remember it all. Now, that's really great, but it's not scientific because you need to say, we need to have the evidence. We need to have hard, hard evidence of every study. But he didn't do that. He did write it down, but after the time when he'd analysed them. So it's really open to researcher bias, okay? That's what you could argue. And if you can explain that even more, and you could say, well, he's already got a theory in his mind, and he's going to just remember the bits, okay, that these women, you know, talked about, or what they suggested, that fits in with his theories. So, researcher bias. Finally, theories are deterministic. Don't just write that. Theories are deterministic. Yeah, but you won't hardly get a mark for that at all, unless you say what this means. Okay, this means that, you know, and of course, he's not alone in this. Okay, the biological model is almost all the models in psychology are deterministic. So, Freud is arguing that when you grow up, you have lots of subconscious issues, you know, because of things which you weren't able to deal with. You develop defense mechanisms, everything else. And this can mess up your life later because you've no control over your parenting or your potty training or how you related to your mother and, you know, feeding issues. You've no control over all of that. And so your life seems to be messed up. Um, you know, because of this early conditioning. However, even though it is deterministic, in that sense, theoretically, a very good AO3, if you can write this down, is there is an argument that is against that, okay? And it is this. Because of the psychoanalysis that Freud has taught, you know, therefore... Even though there is determinism in the theory, there is a way out. You go into psychoanalysis and you cure yourself. So it's no longer deterministic. It's no longer ruining your life, all of your defense mechanisms and your subconscious phobias. You can release them. You can have a catharsis in psychoanalysis and become free. 
Okay, so I do hope that was useful for you. And as I say, don't overdo the AO1. Leave out psychosexual stages. I never mentioned them. And that would earn you.